So the next item on the agenda is a talk followed by questions and answers on our recently completed survey that was conducted by King's College London, one of the key participants in our project uh, under the direction of Professor Bobby Duffy, uh, who has done an unbelievable work in putting together one of the most sophisticated or opinion surveys that I've ever seen, if I may say so myself. The results will be presented by Dr. Paul Stoneman, uh, who is a political scientist from King's College London, as well as his co-authors, Finley Malcolm and James Wright. Welcome, Paul and Finley. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here um, on such an amazing project. Um, I'm new to the project, so I'm learning lots of different layers to it. And uh, as Maria said, um, our specialty here is on the um, survey design. Um, and it's great to be here. Uh, as somebody else has noticed, the Brits arrive and so does the rain. So um, sorry about that. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, some of our initial findings here. Now, the challenge that we had today, to be honest with you, is that we've got so many findings, we found it very difficult to spoil that down into the key constituent interesting parts. So what we're gonna to present to you is some elements relating to um, how trust and values uh, in terms of creating different cultures um, can influence sort of people's attitudes and relationships with science and scientific experts. Uh, we're also gonna talk about exactly how um, from a science communication angle, exactly. How can we better understand the cognitive profile of different populations? Because um, one of the things obviously that's a challenge at the moment is making sure we get the scientific uh, communication messages uh, through to the public. Um, so we're gonna present some results today. Um, it won't be all of the countries for reasons of brevity. And we're gonna focus on a selection of countries and for reasons of brevity, we're gonna be focused on uh, some particular research questions. Um, and you're gonna get a double act today. It's gonna to be myself, um, but also uh, Finlay Malcolm, who I'd like to introduce now, who's gonna talk about the survey. Thanks. Finlay. Brilliant, hi everybody. Thanks very much. Um, it's great to be here. I'm Finlay Malcolm, as Paul says. Um, so let me just kick things off just by saying a little bit about the um, survey that we ran and some of the details about that. So it was conducted for us by Savanta Comres. You've got just over 12,000 people in the survey. Um, so six countries that we've looked at. So we've got UK, Ireland, Poland, Italy, Norway and Germany. And you've got just over 2000 people in each country. And it was run um, around about six months ago, so 4th to 19th of January this year. Um, there's a seventh country that we have data on now, uh, that's Armenia. So they've been running a survey over the last few months and um, the data is currently being processed. So we're very excited to be able to get that soon and uh, compare that to the European countries that we have. Uh, so let me just say a little bit about uh, some of the key themes. So roughly five cross-cutting themes that are in the survey. And there's about 50, just over 50 questions in the survey in total. So you've got people's, so the public's perception on the character and motives of um, climate scientists and scientists specializing in coronavirus and um, measures that compare that to people's views on government in the, on the same issues. Um, the importance to people of issues of climate change and coronavirus, particularly relative to other things, such as the economy or healthcare, that kind of thing. A battery of questions on misperceptions or accurate perceptions as well on climate change and coronavirus, uh, including some um, sort of borderline conspiratorial questions as well that are in there that are quite interesting. Um, feelings on personal and government responsibilities towards climate change and coronavirus, uh, and a battery of questions that measure people's personal values that we'll talk about um, in this presentation. 
that are quite telling about people's responses to the different uh, to, to some of the, the questions in the first four categories there. Um, so here's what we're going to do today. So we're, so we're thinking about this question. So to what degree does the issue of trust in scientific experts present a unique challenge for European nations or is this a kind of more overlapping challenge? So think about some of the national level differences um, and where some of these problems cross up, uh, crop up um, across different countries. So I'm gonna focus on this first part here. So we're gonna think about trust itself, um, the relationship between trust that people have in scientists in general, and then the different kinds of scientists that we've, we've asked people to think about, um, and then government, and some of the relationships between <laughs> trust, some of the relationships between trust in um, government and then how that affects people's trust in scientists. Okay, uh, and then I'll think about people's values and how um, values relate to, to people's uh, trust in science. So, so there, are, there are certain values that go along with being pro uh, or anti-science. Um, Paul, do you want to say what you're going to talk about? Yeah, so that'll be the uh, first part of the talk today. And then the second part of the talk, I'll be introducing some measures that actually try to speak to the different cognitive profiles uh, within the populations. So we'll be looking at this across countries, first of all, just to see whether we can actually use these organizing concepts of awareness, attentiveness, and engagement uh, with science, uh, scientific experts and scientific issues. Um, but comparing uh, three countries in particular, we focus on Poland, Germany and the UK. Um, won't have time. So for those of you interested in results from Italy, Ireland or Norway, I do apologize in advance. Um, but as I say, for reasons of brevity, because we've got so much data, uh, we had to just select um, three countries. And as you will see from the charts that we present, actually Germany, the UK and the Poland represent a nice selection of countries here, because when we start to look at the trust issues, you'll see that they're nicely spread out actually across the uh, continuum there. So we're going to try and get a handle on how cognizant that people are, uh, particularly of climate change, because we've got the two issues here of climate change and COVID we could be talking about. Again, it'd be difficult to cover both. So we're going to just focus on climate change um, for this talk. But also once we've actually sort of better understood the cognitive profiles of populations, try to understand the cognitive profile within the populations, we can then move on to actually the last question here, which is how do people evaluate what needs to be done about these issues? And again, we'll be focused on climate change there. So we're really trying to set up the broad attitudinal value factors that seem to influence people's relationship to science and scientific experts. We're gonna end up bringing that down to looking at actually how attentive people are and actually how you can actually at a cognitive level engage people in these issues. But also once we've actually measured that and profiled people in terms of the cognitive landscape, whether that cognitive landscape then leads to people framing climate change in different ways and actually supporting different forms of policies and interventions here. So really, as we move through the lecture today, we're really gonna be working towards actually some evidence bases that can really help science communication here. Um, so that's what we're gonna be working through. Back to Finn. Great, okay, so, um, so the first thing that we've done is we've built some kind of trust indexes. So we've got a question here that people were asked on the survey. So please indicate on a score of naught to 10, how much you personally trust each of these people or institutions. So zero, you do not trust the person or institution at all. And 10, you have complete trust. So um, these have been combined. So we've got a government and European commission, that's our political trust index. And then there's three different categories of scientists. So we've got scientists working with government, scientists working with the universities and scientists working at private companies. And then we've got two other indexes. Um, and these are both 
uh, about scientists, but one is about climate change scientists and another is just about coronavirus scientists. And again, it's those three categories. So scientists working with government at universities and then at private companies. So these have been aggregated to create these um, trust in science indexes. Um, okay, so one last precursor just before we look at some of the results. So it's just worth just saying a little bit about how we're understanding trust here. Um, so the survey was developed with some literature on trust in mind, particularly some of the philosophical literature. I think Karen Jones was quite, quite key. So um, we think about trust as having two components, which are quite common in the philosophical literature. So it's you sort of got an inclination or a disposition or a motivation to, to rely on somebody or something, usually over a particular domain. So if we're thinking about relying on scientists, it's to conduct research according to proper scientific standards and then to report the findings in an accurate way, something approximating to that. And then the second is what some, sometimes people call a normative expectation condition. So this is um, a view that the scientists, a kind of positive view about the motives of the scientist. Uh, and there's there's different accounts about this, but the, the one from Jones is um, that you 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 um, your view is that the, the other person is motivated by the thought that you are relying on them. So you know they're they're thinking that you're relying on them and they're thinking, oh, I better do a good job then. Um, other accounts. It's more like, you know, they think they've got some kind of commitment to do what, to follow through uh, in, in the, 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 the necessary way. Um, and that's going to be important for the way that we actually try and break down whether people have trust or whether they have to these other things. So um, you can have a lack of trust. So just a kind of absence of trust, maybe um, a kind of vacancy or you haven't really thought about it or something like that or you can actually have distrust. And I suppose the key difference here is that in the lack of trust, you don't really have a negative or a positive view, just nothing really. Um, and it might be a little bit easier to persuade these people to come round to trust if you show that the people are trustworthy. But if, you, if you're distrusting, it's a little bit harder to bring you around to a position of trust. You've got a, a more negative view of the motives of the other person, you're disinclined to rely on them. Okay. so. Let's just start to have a look at some of the findings. So um, what we've got here is the general trust in scientists. It's not specific to climate or COVID. This is just scientists in general. So we've got the uh, mean scores out of 10 uh, across the bottom. And then on the side, you've got the, the numbers of people who've indicated this, you know, seven out of 10, eight out of 10. As you can see, it's quite a positive view. So you've got a fair, fair degree of trust in scientists, I think it's fair to say. And it's, it's hard to say exactly at what point in the scale people could be said to trust scientists or maybe lack trust. I mean, sometimes people say, you know, seven out of 10 upwards, you know, that, that kind of thing. Maybe we trust scientists. Um, somewhere in the middle, maybe you, you, you just have a lack of trust, possibly towards the further end, you, you lack trust or maybe you distrust um, one way to get a little bit further along with that is to cross classify with another question that we have in the survey. So we actually asked um, this question to people. Uh, it's not coming up. Will you move it on? Thank you. Yep. So um, do you think scientists are motivated by the thought you're counting on them? So we've got that question in the survey. So if that comes up positive, then, um, and, and people say have like quite a high degree of trust, maybe they're saying seven, eight, nine out of 10. I think it's fair to say, you know, these people have trust. And in, in the other direction, if they, if they give a negative response to that, if they say, you know, look, I don't, I think scientists are not motivated by the thought we're counting on them. And they've given a two, three out of 10, maybe they're more distrusting. And again, that, that, that you, can, you can answer agnostically to this as well. I'm not too sure. And you put a five, you know, maybe they just kind of lack trust, something like that. But this, this gives you a, a sort of general picture of um, how much trust there is in scientists in general. Now let's see, I'm not getting a response out of this. Oh, okay. Uh, so um, 
So what we've got here now is trust in climate change scientists. Um, and again, it shows quite a positive view of people's trust in science, uh, climate change scientists in general. Um, but one of the things that you can see that's uh, slightly changed is that there's been quite a significant jump in the frequency of people who've put zero out of 10 to climate change scientists. There's been a little bit of an increase in the people who've put 10, not quite as strong as the people who put zero. There's actually gone up by about 150 people compared to scientists in general. Um, and this finding gets really quite strong in the case of um, coronavirus scientists. So here you see much more polarization. So the people who've put zero has gone up um, by about twofold uh, compared to scientists in general. And the people who've put 10 has gone up by about threefold compared to scientists in general. So um, coronavirus is a polarizing topic for people and that filters into people's trust in scientists as well. And it's, it's likely to be a kind of political effect there. And you can see this borne out in the, uh, in the data and the evidence itself. So this is quite an interesting finding and worth bearing in mind when it comes to um, <laughs> trying to encourage people to trust uh, in scientists that it is a very polarizing, polarizing thing. Okay. Um, so let's just move into some of the next data. It's just worth thinking about why it is that trust actually matters for the purposes of public policy. Um, so a lack of trust in authority, a lack of trust in scientists um, is, is widely found to lead to a kind of lower compliance with public policy measures. So we found this in the case of, or lots of people found this in the case of COVID. Um, so people who uh, tend to trust scientists less are less inclined to get vaccinated, less inclined to adhere to social distancing guidelines. There are other factors involved, of course, but trust in scientists is very important here. And similarly, people who might have a lack of trust in climate scientists are maybe going to be less inclined to change their lifestyle, you know, retrofit their homes to, uh, to solar paneling rather than gas boilers or change their vehicles or um, put in costly home insulation. Um, and there's just two problems that I just want to explore that, that have come from our data or two, two challenges, if you like. Thank you. Um, so the first is that um, some of the data we have suggests that a lack of trust in political institutions le actually leads to a lack of trust in scientists. There's a strong relationship between the two. Um, and the, the importance of this is that political institutions need to be quite careful with keeping the trust of um, the general public, because it's, it's gonna cascade and, and cause, cause uh, negative effects when it comes to other authorities, and particularly scientific authorities. Um, and we'll show some evidence on that in a moment. And then a second challenge here is that a lack of trust in scientific authorities actually increases a reliance on non-expert sources. So this one is perhaps not that surprising, but um, I'll show you some, some kind of interesting data that's come out of the survey on this. So in particular, the, the less you trust scientific authorities, the more inclined you are to just trust friends and family, to get information about climate and COVID, uh, climate change and coronavirus from your friends and family. And just from a philosophical point of view and epistemological point of view, um, this is going to create a kind of unreliable epistemic environment. You're perhaps going to be led away from knowledge towards false belief um, because friends and family are not really expert sources. And they may be, but they're not gonna tend to be. 
Um, and there are a few interesting philosophical theories that um, can, can bolster this idea. So um, some of the recent work in social epistemology of echo chambers that focuses on in-group, out-group dynamics is, is quite interesting here. So um, what you might find is that people are involved in, in epistemic discrediting. So this is people outside of your group you would say, you know, they're not reliable, we're not going to treat them as sources of information, and people who are inside the group, you're going to enhance their credibility as sources of evidence, but if they're not reliable, and it's the people outside of your group that are reliable, then this is going to be a problem for knowledge, basically, and true belief. So let's look at some of the findings. So first thing is just to do a comparison. Um, so if we just think about the first problem first, so this is the relationship between trusting government and trust in scientists. So I'll just show you how much people trust government compared to how much they trust scientists. So this was the first um, chart that we looked at. So this is people's general trust in scientists. And then over the top, we can just overlay. Um, so can we overlay? <laughs> We can overlay. So that's people's trust in government over the top. So you can see that people's trust in government is nowhere near as high as their trust in science. Um, and the next slide we have tells you that the um, less people trust government, um, the less inclined they are to trust scientists. So as a line of best fit there, so the more you trust government, the more inclined you'll be to trust scientists. So this is why it's important for governments to um, make sure that they are making themselves as trustworthy as possible. And then um, I wanted to, to show you the results of the um, trust in friends and family versus trust in scientists mean. So the um, more likely you are to trust scientists, the less likely you are to, it's actually uh, to take friends and family as authoritative information on climate change and coronavirus. So, um, so that just bears out those two points that we were just thinking about. Okay, um, so then just the final thing that I want to cover in this part is about people's values and the relationship between people's values and their and people's inclination to um, to trust scientific authorities. So um, in, in, in cultures, you know, values tend to be quite heavily entrenched and different um, nations tend to, um, people within in different nations tend to hold quite similar values. Um, and some of those values are quite, um, are, have quite a strong connection uh, with people's willingness to, to trust in scientists. Um, and there are two in particular um, that we want to just explore for a moment. So, so the first is um, universalism. So, that, so actually, this um, this is actually taken from Schwartz, and it's the uh, the, the the measures of um, values in this theory that uh, we're um, we're using, and that that in, inform the battery of questions that we asked on this. And I'll show you some of those questions in a moment. But um, what we've got here is universalism up here in the uh, top right. And this is a kind of other facing value uh, set. So you, you're, you're less just focused on the self and more focused on others. And it goes along with uh, views about equality and social justice and uh, also the environment. And then on the opposite side, you've got achievement, which tends to be a bit more self-focused and more focused on personal uh, success and ambition and those kinds of things. Um, and what we found is that people who 
tend to value universalism more, tend to trust scientists more, and people who uh, tend to value achievement more tend to trust scientists less. That's quite intuitive, maybe quite unsurprising, um, but uh, in fact, the data bears it out. So um, there we are, thank you. Um, so these are the questions that we used to actually test these things. This is universalism first. So um, it is important that every person in the world should be treated equally. I believe everyone should have equal opportunities in life. It is important to listen to people who are different from me. Even when I disagree with others, I still want to understand them. And I strongly believe that people should care for nature. Looking after the environment is important to me. So these are the, the, the questions that we use to test people's universalism. Um, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. Sorry, there we are. Um, okay, and here's the, uh, th this was the result. So as you can see, as people increase in universalism, they increase in their trust in scientists. So people who score lower on universalism tend to trust scientists less. Um, so that's the universalism score and then the achievement scores. So um, the two question measures here, it's important to me to show my abilities I want, uh, I want people to admire what I do. Being very successful is important to me. I hope people will recognize my achievements. Uh, so there we go again. So people who score high on achievement, um, trust scientists less. People who score um, high on trust scientists score lower on achievement. So um, why does this matter? <laughs> why does it matter to understand this? And um the answer we're thinking about i mean at least for the purposes of today is just trying to um communicate to people with different value structures the importance of different scientific policies so kind of a marketing thing really knowing your audience um so we just think you know, communication of policy it needs to be it needs to be informed by um an awareness of what the values are of the people in the society, if people are more universalistic or if they are more achievement oriented. Um, because you need to be able to build a kind of critical mass of public consensus in order to have success with public policies and get them um, received well and actually have people follow through on them. Um, and some research finds that look, science communication is very fact driven, but it would be maybe beneficial if it was a little bit more uh, values, involved values as well as facts. Um, but just a final point here is that also involving public in deliberation uh, has also been seen to kind of help, help to overcome some of these entrenched cultural values. Um, but th this is, a, this is a, a national level challenge. So this is really for, for, for countries to try and try and challenge on their on their own on their own level. But at least what the results from our survey show is what the different value structures are within each different uh, society and how they affect people's inclination to trust scientists. So at this point, I'm going to uh, hand over to Paul, who's going to take things from here. Thanks, Finn. So, um, as Finn's demonstrated, we've got some preliminary evidence to suggest that these broader and deeper entrenched value and attitudinal structures um, are something we have to take into account when we're trying to understand people's outcomes here in terms of their engagement with science and um, scientific issues. Um, so the next stage then we thought of really is sort of, we understand sort of more this, the reservoir of values and attitudes that might shift countries to be more sort of pro-science or engage with scientific issues than not. And we wanted to bring that down and actually think about differences within populations and trying to get some measures from the survey that could help us to really understand the cognitive profiles um, of uh, the different people within countries. Because um, part of the challenge of science communi uh, communication really is to try and get that message through 
that this is a factual issue, and not only is it a factual issue that there's a scientific consensus about it, that actually we need to do something, and actually we need to do something, as we'll see, actually splits between usually individualistic approaches where we need actually people themselves to actually change their behavior and their lifestyles, but also we actually need this to be led at a governmental level. We actually need to get populations on board with supporting public policy programs um, that can actually tackle issues um, like climate change. Um, now, for the analysis I'm about to show, um, as I said, for reasons of brevity, uh, I'll only be focusing on climate change and um, climate change within three countries. So it'd be Germany, UK, and Poland. So I do apologize um, for missing out on the other three countries. So awareness, attentiveness, and uh, engagement. I mean, one of my friends um, has an amazing job of uh, growing olives, actually, in Greece. And one of the difficulties that she has is actually getting her products sold um, in supermarkets. And one of the things she has to deal with is she fights for space in supermarkets, okay? Space is at a premium. And customers in those supermarkets are bombarded uh, with choice and different products to buy. Um, now, the same issue is to, uh, becomes, uh, relates to science and scientific issues as well. The information space out there is incredibly crowded. Um, social media hasn't helped with this. The fragmentation of the media hasn't necessarily helped with this. Um, and so we're fighting for this space, particularly when you think about climate change scientists trying to get across the importance of this issue, trying to get across that now is the time where actually we need to actually for individuals and governments to be doing something about it, to get that message through and to get it to stick and then to get people to actually be consistently and ongoingly attentive and engaged with these issues is a real challenge, um, particularly for science uh, communication. So what can we say about our sample, our countries and our sample in terms of awareness? Well, 33% of our sample indicated they are not aware of the actions being taken to tackle climate change. So about a third, of our a third of their population within our six countries would say that they're not actually aware of any actions being taken uh, to tackle climate change. When it comes to actually being attentive, so awareness, attentiveness, they're close conceptual cousins, but they're slightly different. In terms of attentiveness, in terms of actually paying attention on a regular basis to any information relating to these topics, 40%. Um, said that they did not personally pay any attention to information on climate change. So we've got, you know, just from that, just that basic descriptive statistics gives us an indication that we've still got some way to go uh, within Europe in terms of actually getting this message across that you need to be aware and you need to be attentive on this. When it comes to engagement, uh, we had a series of questions that asked people about the type of... Um, scientific outlets that they engage with, whether they watch documentaries about science, whether they read literature, um, or whether they just follow scientific um, stories within the news. As we can see, 28% um, have never or rarely uh, watched documentaries about science. Sorry for the typo there, it's not was, watch documentaries. 52% um, have never or rarely read um, a scientific magazine. And 31% do not follow any news about scientific uh, research or discoveries. So let's break this down um, just by countries, um, the three countries that we've chosen for our sample here. Um, so at the top here, we've just got in orange, we've got the awareness measure. Uh, the second row, we've just got the uh, attentiveness measure. And then the final three rows, we're just looking at these percentages in terms of engagement. Um, I mean, the first thing to note here when we were looking at this is, is really just looking at the Poland column actually here. Um, if you look at the figures of Poland here, they're much lower than actually uh, the other countries. So in terms of people not being attentive, not being aware and not being engaged, um, that section of the public within Poland is much lower than compared to the UK and Germany. And one of the things that we found surprising actually is when you look at Germany in particular, um, we were quite surprised that 44% indicated um, that they were not aware of actions being taken to tackle climate change. We found that very surprising, actually. 
We also found it surprising that for the UK um, that when it comes to actually engaging with literature on this issue, scientific literature, the UK is really out on its own here in terms of not <laughs> reading scientific literature and scientific magazines. I mean, 70%, it's absurdly high. Um, so good on the Poles, good on the Germans here, but I'm afraid the Brits have uh, a little bit more engaging to do when it comes to um, scientific literature. So we found this quite surprising, actually, and deeply troubling in many ways. Now, the problem of just looking at these single items like this, I mean, it gives you an insight into the nature of the populations and perhaps sort of how aware, how attentive, how engaged they are. Um, but it's a little bit bitty. It's a little bit fragmented here. Um, so what we wanted to do really was to utilize some sort of method, some sort of statistical technique that could actually help us consolidate this information some way. So I'm a latent variable model. I love latent class analysis, okay? It's like uncovering the hidden, okay? And the beauty of latent class analysis for our purposes here is that we could take those measures and try to see if we can segment and profile the populations. Now, one of the issues you have when you've got measures of things like awareness and attentiveness and engagement is that conceptually, you can see they're quite close. Statistically, they correlate quite highly too. So the usual statistical procedures here of putting them into a regression analysis and trying to predict certain outcomes is, is, is problematic to say the least because you're pretty much looking at the same thing. They're slightly different, but you can see that there's an implicit causal relationship between the three concepts. So before you can be attentive, you have to be aware. And before you be engaged in things, you have to be attentive. So one of the ways that you would actually try and unravel the relationship between these concepts is to do something like structural equation modeling, okay? Uh, which I'm not gonna do today. Okay, not going to do it. Sorry. That will be undertaken over the summer because that's a long, grueling process, particularly when you do it, want to do it across six countries. Structural equation modeling can, is a way of trying to untangle the causal relationships between variables that are very closely related. Um, but what would be more revealing for our purposes here, really, um, is to see how the responses to those three issues, um, how they hang together how they actually correlate together and kind of form uh, different mindsets uh, within populations, okay? So you can imagine people that are highly aware, highly attentive and highly engaged. You can imagine some sections of the public that are perhaps aware, but not very attentive and not very engaged. And you can imagine some people who are just out of the equation totally, okay? They don't, they're not attentive, they're not aware, and they're not engaged at all. Um, so we use latent class analysis, just to try and see if we can actually uncover uh, these mindsets within the population. And in doing so, what we did, we actually found three, four distinct groups of people, depending on which country we're looking at here. So we'll start with Germany. The first group, uh, the first latent class group we find in Germany here, uh, what I've labeled the aware and the attentive and the engaged. So 44% of the population from our estimates in Germany um, are people who are really on the case, okay? I mean, they're really aware, they're really attentive and they're really engaged, okay? The next group that we've got here is the aware and attentive. So these are kind of like the first, so they're aware, they've been thinking about it, but they're not really engaging with the literature. They're not really keeping up to date with any new developments. Yeah. But, you know, we've got about 55% of the German population that you could say are on the case, they're on the ball here. We have a third latent class group here, which we would label as the low engagement uh, group. Now, these are people that don't signal much awareness of any... Uh, actions being taken to tackle climate change. They haven't paid any attention to it. And they register some engagement with the literature though. Okay, so it's, it's kind of like the issue for climate change here for them is something that's sort of bubbling away in the background. They're not really, pay, they're not really aware of what's going on. They're not really attentive, but 
in terms of their information, it's the topic that does pass them, okay? It is something they come across. So 19% of the German population would say are low engagers. The final group are the disengaged. Uh, disengaged people are not aware, they're not attentive, and they're disengaged from searching about any information about climate change at all, okay? So that's Germany. This is how that breaks down in terms of segments. Now, one thing we want to do is usually when we form these lane classes, we also want to understand what sort of variables predict membership of these lane classes too. So it's always illustrative to try and break these classes down by some basic demographic information. This is quite unique in my experience. I haven't seen this much before, but when we try and we look at the demographic profiles of these different classes, don't actually find much differences across them actually within each class you get generally the same spread of age groups the same balance of men and women and the same sort of educational profile the only difference really is that when it comes to the first two lane classes here the two aware groups that they're split there's more likely to be contained by people who have received a scientific education at a university level so that increases, having, having that education increases your probability of being a member of the first two aware groups, but not by much, to be honest with you, not that great deal. So this is quite interesting, actually. You've got these different mindsets, but actually these mindsets are prevalent across different age groups, men and women, and different educational groups. So it's quite interesting, really. Next, we come on to the UK. So again, we have a four class solution. So the best fitting model here was actually four classes. And we can see that we have, again, the aware, attentive and engaged group at uh, 44%. Um, now these people were far more, far more likely to have studied science at university, okay? And they were mostly under the age of 50. So different from Germany here, the formation of this mindset is very much linked to perhaps generations. I'd say generations, could be life cycle, but let's say generations. And it's very much linked to education as well, which in the UK is very heavily correlated with social class. So I think in the UK, the formations of these mindsets is partly driven by underlying uh, generational issues and partly driven by social class issues too. So that's 30, sorry, that's 32% um, for the aware, attentive, and engaged group here. Um, when it comes to the aware and attentive group, so these people who are attentive but not necessarily engaged, um, that's at 33%. Okay, and these are mostly over the age of 50. So they're aware, they're attentive, but not really paying much attention in terms of information searching. We also have the uh, low engagement group, which is at 10% in the UK. And finally, we have the disengaged group at 25%. Now, the disengaged group um, is, well, 62% of the disengaged group is mostly over the age of 50. So again, that reinforces the idea that actually there's probably some generational aspect towards the formation of these mindsets. And again, we have um, the educational wearable kicking in as well here. 74% of this disengaged group did not study science at university. So strong generational and class effects, it seems to be happening in the UK, which is not surprising, actually. Then we come to Poland, our third group. Now for Poland, um, very different class solution here. Four classes didn't work very well, okay? Uh, a much better fitting model was three classes here. Um, so what is missing really here um, is the, um, we go back to the previous slide actually, it's the low engagement group. We don't really have the low engagement group in, in, in Poland, actually. Because um, remember, if you remember before on the um, table we presented much earlier on, um, Polish people are very much on the ball, actually, in terms of being aware, being attentive, and engaging with uh, literature. So the biggest group um, in uh, Poland, though, is the aware and attentive mixture of different engagement. There. There's a strong awareness, strong attentiveness, but a mixture of engagement there. Um, whereas the aware and attentive and engaged group, that comes out at 29% in there, okay? So we've got a high level of awareness and attentiveness. And when it comes to the engaged group, we have those who are sort of breaking off from the aware and attentive group. These are the ones that have studied science at university. 
but you know, you had 55% to 29% there. And you've got, you know, a very, very strong um, cohort of people that are aware and attentive, we've got 84%. And then we've got um, the remaining 60% in Poland who are disengaged. And what's driving this really, not much age factors going on here, not much uh, differences between men and women, but it's all about whether you studied science really at university. That's driving the differences in the class formations here uh, across three countries. So, what does this tell us about what different populations expect to be done about the issue of climate change? Well, we had some additional measures that we could tap into here to uncover that information. So we also captured people's thoughts on um, what they would support in terms of policies. So we asked some questions about reforming environmental taxes um, to try and dissuade businesses and industries um, from uh, changing their behaviors to become more pro-environment. Um, government setting more ambitious CO2 targets. So we measure here on political leadership on the issue. Also actually sort of in terms of the structure uh, and the investment in terms of, particularly in terms of our energy use and improving the efficiencies of energy. We've also asked questions actually um, about whether people think that actually that there's not much that can be done. And I think, unfortunately, this is a depressing thing that perhaps we do have to measure here. Uh, so we asked some questions about, well, are you not really that keen on supporting any policies because you think it's just too difficult to tackle this issue? Do you think that climate change is beyond our control? Do you think there's no point in changing your personal behavior because it'll make no difference anyway? And then we had some other questions that we're looking at more individual lifestyle responses here. So the questions about whether you support recycling as a way of tackling climate change, as well as avoiding single use plastics. And out of this, we get three different indices here again. So much like Finn was talking about with the trust measures, we can actually add them together to form an index. We can do the same here in terms of the evaluations of what needs, needs to be done. Um, so the first three are actual structural responses. The next three are actually measures of fatalism. Uh, what's the point? And then the last two measures are actually to do with individual responses. And if you read the climate change literature, particularly in terms of, of attitudes, particularly in terms of policy responses, you'll find that a lot of literature will cover this structural versus individualistic uh, responses to climate change. So we've got those three measures. Uh, structural responses, fatalism, individual responses. How does that actually intersect with our latent classes that we had? So for Germany, what we find in Germany um, is that actually regardless of what mindset you adopt here, there is without a doubt incredibly strong support for structural responses, okay? Doesn't even matter if you're low engaged, and it doesn't really matter if you're disengaged. There is a sense that this should be something that is done at a governmental level, okay? If we go to the last column here, again, regardless of which latent class that you're fitting in, regardless of what mindset you adopt, there is very strong support um, for individual responses of recycling and avoiding use of single-use plastics. When it comes to fatalism here, um, this is where you get some variation across the classes, okay? So these mindsets don't really help us explain any differences in terms of structural responses, individual responses, but these linked classes do actually help us understand differences in terms of this sense of fatalism. And what you can see here is that the less attentive, uh, aware and attentive and engaged you become, the more and more likely you're moving towards a strong position of fatalism on this, okay? So that's in Germany. In the UK, sorry, Dan, thanks, thank you. We get a very mixed picture in the UK, okay? Difficult to make sense of what's going on with the Brits sometimes, really is, as you've seen recently in the past five years or so. Um, so what we can say here though, is if we're looking at the structural responses column, um, there is a tendency uh, within the public to support government led action, but it's not as strong as Germany. And in fact, as you move across the mindsets here, and again, you become less aware and attentive and you become less engaged, 
actually that response, that evaluative response that we need to do this at government level becomes much weaker. Okay. To the point where you've got the low engaged and the disengaged. Well, they're not as gung ho for this to be tackled at a governmental level. Flip to the last column here, we look at the individual responses. Again, as you'd expect, the aware, attentive, and engaged, and the aware, attentive, very strong support for individual responses, recycling and using, uh, avoiding using single use plastics. That becomes slightly weaker um, if you're not aware and attentive, um, and again, slightly weaker um, if you're disengaged. But overall, you would say there's still a prevalent norm for individual responses, regardless of your mindset here. But that's not the same for structural responses, actually. Um, so when it comes to this is something that the UK government really has to think about, that moving forward, if they're actually trying to get support to tackle climate change at a governmental level, there's going to be a stubborn section of the public that might not like it. They might not go for it. So that's one concern. But the biggest concern, really, I think in the UK at the moment, is fatalism. So if you look at the middle column here, well, as you'd expect, the low and engaged mindsets and the disengaged mindset, they have a strong sense of fatalism, okay? So it might be the case that they're not supporting structural responses because they think it's too late or what's the point or, it's, or we don't have the institutional capacity to tackle this issue. What's really concerning is actually the aware, attentive and engaged group. The other countries we're looking at here, if you're aware, attentive and engaged, you've got a sense that something can be done about this. If you're aware, attentive and engaged in the UK, there's an increasing sense that actually there's not much that can be done about this. So that group, the aware and attentive and engaged, starts to bifurcate between those who really want urgent, strong governmental action and those who are kind of losing their faith on the issue. And that's something we've really got to watch out for, particularly in the UK. So we come to Poland. Um, we have three classes here. Structural responses, well, it becomes weaker again as you move across, as you move away from awareness and attentiveness uh, and uh, become more disengaged. Very strong levels of support though at an individual level in Poland uh, for recycling and not using single-use plastics. In fatalism, a lot of hope in Poland still. They're not as jaded as the Brits on this issue. Um, so very weak level of fatalism uh, for the aware, attentive, and engaged, very weak level of fatalism for aware and attentive group, and just moderate um, fatalism for dis disengaged. So, Three different countries here, uh, and three, three quite different profiles here um, in relation to how the populations think we should respond um, to these issues. So just some final thoughts um, on what we've presented here. I mean, are there overlapping concerns? Well, there certainly is. Uh, in relation to climate change, at least, um, you've probably got around 15 to 25% of adult populations that are disengaged. Um, but in Germany and in the UK, not in Poland, but in Germany and the UK, there is this additional group of low engagers. You know, it's very peripheral to their lives. They're aware of some information coming across, but they're not aware and they're not attentive. So we've got to find some ways to actually grab hold of their mindsets here and actually get them aware and attentive and engaged in these topics. Overlapping solutions. Well, less so. Um, as Finn pointed out earlier, um, there are differences um, in terms of entrenched attitudes and values here. And they certainly do pose um, a bit of a conundrum for the way that we actually communicate um, scientific issues, different socio-cultural aspects to this and very much different political context to this. Throw in to the equation that you've got differences in cognitive profiles, I would say that actually the solutions here have to be tailored at a nation state level. They really do. There are overlapping issues, but actually when you start to dig down to the data, you can actually see that you're working with quite different audiences, not only across, but within 
uh, the countries. So strong support for individual actions to tackle climate change. So that's good. I mean, that's one positive thing we can say. That seems to be holding up at the moment. Individual responses across the different countries are holding up, even for those who are disengaged, actually. Strong support um, in Germany for structural policy responses. More varied picture in the UK and in Poland as well. And one of this goes back to actually what Finn was talking about here. Maybe that varied picture in the UK, I'm not quite sure about Poland, but I can certainly speak with some authority about the UK, that this is perhaps more a politically charged topic. And that's not very helpful, really, in some respects. So this goes back to the idea, really, that governments have to be very careful about maintaining their trustworthiness because that diff diffuse support and trustworthiness with government, if that lowers, then that can actually sometimes spill over into other public authorities and institutions, which is a problem. But also the other aspects of the political angle of this is if that we take, if we make these issues highly political, even though there's a strong scientific consensus in this, if we politicize these, very difficult to get the communication done effectively because that information will then be filtered. There'll be perceptual filtering going on by political identities. And that's very difficult then to actually establish some consensus within a country. Some evidence suggests that faith, uh, fatalism is creeping in, perhaps, yeah. Um, and as I say, in the UK, that sense of fatalism is actually prevalent amongst those who are aware and attentive and engage. Now we need to do a little bit more digging into this. And this was what would be great actually for the deliberative aspect to the projects here. I mean, is that sense of fatalism because they think it's just too late that we just missed the boat here, it's too late. Is it too big a problem? Is it an issue of politics? Is there just an absence of political will? Or even if we had the political will, do we not just have the tools, the institutional capacity to actually tackle this? So it'd be really good actually in a more qualitative way to get a, a better sense of what this fatalism is actually about, because only then can we tackle that fatalism in some effective way to say, no, there is some hope here. But just finally, we should remember um, that trust in science and scientific, it does remain relatively high, okay? There are, obviously issues that we need to deal with here. There are stubborn sections of the public that disengage. We have this issue of fatalism, but the trust in science and scientific experts is very strong relative to other public institutions. So I think we can run with that. Uh, I'm gonna have to run with that because that provides us with a vital moral resource really when it comes to achieving our green, greenhouse gas emissions here and reducing uh, and achieving our goals. Anyway, thank you for listening. So thank you very much, Paul and Finley, for an excellent presentation of this very interesting result. We have about almost a half an hour for questions. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. People would need a bit of time, but I can see one hand up already. Lucas, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, uh, thank you. Hi, Maria. Can you hear me? Yes. By the way, I should I should explain. Lucas is one well of my PhD students working <laughs> on the topic, so I'm very glad you are there. I'm so keen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you. I was uh, really excited. It was uh, great to hear the. the data more clear uh, now, but I wanted to come back to one of the points that was mentioned at the very beginning uh, was said about the differences between the scientists working in these three different sectors. So you have the private companies, the government and the universities. And I was wondering, what is the difference there, especially from my research, I'm very interested in, in these differences among these uh, sectors. So could you say more about that, please? Yeah, thanks for your question, Lucas. Um, very little difference, to be honest with you. Um, so from a statistical point of view, we were looking at the correlation between these items and we're looking at correlations of about 0.8 and above level. So this is, this is why we've actually tried to tackle this more at an attitudinal level um, rather than a belief level. 
really, is that um, some people will discriminate um, between those who are working on particular areas of public policy, but actually more often than not, I'd say about eight times out of 10, nine times out of 10, really, if you trust scientists in general, you're gonna trust COVID scientists and you're gonna trust climate change scientists as well. So, I mean, some people would say that this indicates perhaps a lack of sophistication on the public in terms of differentiation between scientists in different domains of knowledge. Um, or you could say that actually there's no, there's no reason um, to think that COVID climate change, uh, COVID scientists or climate change scientists are any, are any that different from your average scientists in general. So not much difference to what honest, Lucas, um, I, I would say that actually there's more of a, this is more attitudinal than belief driven. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe we can alternate between online questions and live questions if there are any questions from the room. Alain? Maybe you can introduce yourselves as well before asking your question. This is working already, right? Okay. Hi, I'm Alan Amrakanyan. I'm from the American University of Armenia, uh, one of the project partners. Uh, on, uh, I have several method questions, but probably we can do that later on the one on one. Uh, but uh, going back to some of the uh, the charts that I think Finley you cho showed about the extremes of zero trust and, uh, you know, maximum trust. Um, this is kind of the, the airwaves get get uh, filled in by these extremes, yeah. and the middle gets lost. So if you were to advise politicians, what would you advise them? That for me. <laughs> well, you really got... should have your turn as well. Bonjour, <laughs> sir. Um, well, I'm not too sure. They are an overwhelming minority. I mean, there's also a consideration for the media, because the media are the ones who are going to pick up on those extremes and then use them to sell more copy right so um so for the media you might encourage them to focus more on the moderate position so that i would i would say something like that um but the same point applies to the subsequent discussion that we had about the relationship between trusting government and trusting scientists um that <laughs> they need to be make sure they make sure they're earning people's trust so if they're if they're presenting an imbalance um you know saying focusing on these people who have you know zero trust or focusing on these people who have absolute trust in a way that's a little bit disingenuous i think they need to make sure that they're presenting the 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 the, 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 the full picture in order to keep people's trust but yeah yeah I, I, yeah if i could just come back in on that. Um, I mean, I think one of the things about these scales that we have, particularly these 0 to 10 scales, I mean, it's very difficult to sometimes make qualitative sense um, when you're going back to policymaking and saying, look, what sort of publics are we working with here? How, how can you best inform me? Well, let's take those people in the middle part of the scale. I mean, so they give the answers to four, five, six, so smack bang in the middle here. Well, they could be agnostic. They could be indifferent. They could just say, I don't know. They could just be hedging their bets. So if I was a policymaker, I'd go back to the academic and say, well, can you unpack this, please? This isn't that informative. This could go at least two different ways. And when it comes to the extremes, the towels here, and I think particularly when it comes to the low trust here, I think the point that we were making here about these trust scales is that we need to be careful that an absence of trust, an absence of trust is not equated with the presence of distrust. And I think that's one thing I would like to know as a policymaker. I'd like to know that as well. Because if you just have an absence of trust, it is possible that you can engage and perhaps convert these people to actually having more trust. Distrust, on the other hand, is the thought that the relevant actor involved here is not only, not only do you not trust them, you believe that they're actively working against your interest, that there's something fundamentally bad about them. So when people give an answer of zero or one of these scales, we need to do, again, we need to do further digging down into that. Is that just an absence of trust or is that the presence of distrust? So if I was a policymaker, I'd come back to the academic and say, you need to do some more work. Thank you. I think we'll go online now. And uh, I believe Mauricio Martin is the next person. 
Would you like to ask your question? Maurizio? Ah, ah, yes, yes, sorry, thanks. Yes, I was trying to unmute myself. So first of all, uh, thank you for the amazing set of results. Uh, it's really great food for thought and very comprehensive and so on. And I, I know that you are um, probably more interested in the in the general rules that cut across all the different countries, but I'm very interested in the in the variations, especially between uh, Germany and, and the UK. Uh, uh, because as you show um, in, in Germany, in, in the UK, they, they have a lot of trust for scientists, but low trust in government, which is kind of expected, you know, traditionally, maybe in the UK, they, they don't trust the government very much. Also in Germany, you expect them to trust the government very much. I was surprised that they, the trust in scientists in Germany is relatively low. Mm. Uh, it's next to Poland is the second lowest, right? And this is hard to reconcile with the rest of the data, right? Because Germans are universalists. They are highly aware, at, uh, attentive and engaged. Uh, they support large scale interventions and yet they have a low trust uh, uh, in science. So I wonder how you reconcile this kind of um, different uh, points. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. This goes back to another um, issue when it comes to interpreting these trust scales, because one of the things that we can't actually um, get a handle of here is how demanding different publics are. I suspect um, because there's a little bit more cohesiveness in terms of the German population, in terms of how important this issue is and how salient it is, I suspect that perhaps the lower trust measures here might be because they believe that just a lot more can be done. It's about expectations here. So trust, your trust in the government will also be a function of what you expect them and what they've done as well. So it could just be that the German population has higher level ambitions, uh, high level of ambitions and high level expectations about what they want from their authorities to do. So, whereas in the UK, I don't think there's much expectation at the moment that that's the case. So, I agree with you. It's it's an interesting anomaly. I think it's it represents an interesting case study because it doesn't fit the pattern that you're that the, the, as you pointed out. And I suspect expectations might be playing a role here. If if I may come in here and introduce a little of disagreement, because I've been looking into these issues for a very long sure. time. In fact, trust in science in Germany historically is low. If you look at other survey results, Pew results, etc., going back, both Japan and uh, Germany as highly educated. Uh, populations with trust in government have always had low levels of trust in science, and that's for historic reasons. I, wouldn't, I don't need to go into that, but it's very obvious what the historic reasons were. So, so I'm not surprised by that okay. result at all. So we go back to the audience. Catherine, I saw your hand. Uh, yeah. Whatever. Okay. Yes. Uh, Thank you for a uh, very interesting uh, presentation, intriguing results. Uh, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on more on the lessons that you draw. You, uh, I mean, there is this uh, link between trust in government, public institutions generally, and trust in science. And then you say wisely that yeah, politicians then should be concerned about trust in public institutions and 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 uh, and government, but. What then should be their concern is, is uh, I mean, what, what if, if the politicians then ask, well, what then should we do? Uh, we then have, I don't know, what, what would your reply to that be? Will we, we then have to refer back to research on, on trust in public institutions? And the interesting thing there is that one factor that uh, often is often put forward in uh, in this discussion is that quality of government matters a lot for for trust in public institutions and a factor that creates uh, quality of government is also a trustworthy reliant reliable use of science is actually part of this so is there a a circle here that these these i mean what what comes uh, first so this is the first uh, question. And the second is, it's also very interesting, these things about the different value profiles and how that matter. And then you draw a lesson from this saying that science communication maybe should not focus only on facts, but also on values. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more uh, in light of your finding, what, what more concretely would that uh, imply here, really? Okay, thank you. 
Um, okay, so the first point, um, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, some of the some of the scientists they sort of work for government, so they might be seen as part of government as such. So that circle is a little bit, it's a little bit ambiguous from what we've got here, because um, you know how are people seeing those scientists? Are they seeing them as people in universities, or just you know people who are standing up at a lectern talking about coronavirus results? At which point are they any different from the government itself? Mm. Um, but I mean, uh, we've got a problem in the UK at the moment with trusting our government. I think because there's been all this sort of rule breaking going on, that kind of thing, and that's that's having a knock on effect. There has to be. There has to be adhered to standards of political life <laughs> that has to happen that's very it's very very important for the people who are leading the country to be upfront and be truthful that's i mean that that's that's the only point i really really wanted to make there i don't know if that sort of answers what you're wondering about um do you want to add something on that before we talk about that? um yeah i mean just just about that i mean you know it's the is it is it sort of like the chicken and egg what comes first here the trust in government or the trust in science well i i mean yeah it's a question of it's difficult to un untangle the causal relationships here i mean just from a theoretical point of view i would say that it's the trust in government that comes first mostly because it's the it's the one public body that the public will have a direct relationship with I mean, it's ongoing. They'll be, they'll know the names of the people. Well, usually they'll know the names of the people that run in the country. Um, they will have voted for a party. They'll have their strong party identification as well. So, I mean, you don't really have uh, you know a science identification to particular sexes. So, I mean, because it's so ingrained in people's identities at a political the, the politics of this, and because government looms large in every decision uh, that they make here. I would say that because that is so salient, so prominent in the minds of individuals, that any sort of changes to perceptions of trustworthiness of government could have this spillover effect to trust in scientists. So I'd put government prior to science in the causal chain here. Do you want to say something about the values thing? Yeah, the so values. Um, this is really not my area of expertise, kind of marketing policies to, to the members of the public, but um, the thought that was in my mind as I was thinking about that, and you know, there are people who work on science communication here, so they're welcome to uh, disagree with this point. Um, is just that if you, if you're, if a large proportion of your population is very um, focused on self, how can you sell to them climate change policies? Um, maybe you should do it in a way that somehow looks to benefit the, them rather than uh, the wider population. I know that's quite cynical, um, but uh, maybe that's that's an important way to try and do it. Um, so you, you you present the facts in a way that this is going to affect you. Whereas if you're if you're if you're you know if you've got a population that's a little bit more other focused, then maybe it, you're selling it in a way or you're presenting those facts in a way that it's going to affect others. And the environment more more broadly, because that's one of those measures on that universalism scale. So that was my quite slightly amateurish uh, thought there. I mean, we, you know, we're sort of trying to analyze the data and just think about the implications of it. But that that's what I had in mind. Do you have anything on that? Yeah. Thank you. So next we go online. And Peter, you were next. Thank you. Uh, Peter Hugo here. I'm from the Royal Daily Society of Science and Letters. I had one question that was actually related to what you were just discussing. And, and I guess you already partly answer it because on your slides, and I think you also said it, you said that low trust in government leads to low trust in science. But I guess this is not something that you have measured. It's we have more like have a correlation and not a, uh, a causal relationship. Uh, so we have we can speculate about it, but we don't know what leads to what. Uh, and secondly, that was a more factual question. You said, when you say scientific magazines, and we're surprised that I think it was 70% that in, in UK didn't read a scientific magazine. And you said uh, scientific papers, when you say scientific magazine, do you mean popular science magazines 
because then I would find the, the, the number surprising. But if you think scientific journals like Science, Nature, etc., is that surprising that 70% of the population don't read these papers? Um, just on that, that final point there, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's also about following science in the news, as well as scientific magazines, as well as um, scientific websites and so forth. Um, it's surprising given the percentages from the other countries. Um, so, I mean, given the sample of countries that we got, we've got a, a you know, an average here of about 50% um, engagement with it. So it was surprising in the sense that only that the UK deviates from quite significantly deviates from that 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 average really. So that that was the, the surprising aspect about it. Um, in terms of your first point, I, I, I take the point actually. The, the 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 slide title should have been changed on that. Um, you're right. We've got correlation here, not necessarily causation, um, but there's good reason to believe that there are underlying causal mechanisms here in terms of how diffuse support um, for political institutions, any changes there can actually have a knock-on effect to other public institutions. So that, that there is actually corresponding literature that does speak to that claim. Um, we are making the assumption that it's trust in government that comes prior to the, the trust in scientists here. But I, I, I totally take the point that we, we need to caveat that with correlation, not causation. Uh could it also be that the British were more honest about their levels of engagement with science? <laughs> there might be an element of social desirability attached to this. Yes, I, 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 I take the point. Uh, there was a question from the hall. Hi, I'm Ricarda. I work five minutes from here for a German science communication organization. We're also running a survey, so I was really interested in the German results also. And I also really like this idea of bringing science attitudes together with cultural values. And I was interested um, to see why you decided to analyze this relation between trust in scientists and science. Um, and um, the cultural values on a country level, because I would suspect that, for example, in Germany, you would see loads of people kind of deferring on people actively trusting, people lacking trust and people distrusting. And I also would assume they would have kind of variation of people ranking high or lower on this universal. So I was interested to see why you decided to analyze it on a country level. And, and actually, my second question um, would be about kind of like this potential spillover effect from a lack of trust in government um, to a lack in scientists. And I think um, it's not just something that we see in Germany, we discussed in Germany in the context of that policymakers are not aware of that. But I think in some cases, they are actively taking this risk in kind of like referring to science in different ways and in negative ways in order to kind of like being in favor and arguing in favor of different policy options. So I think in some cases, for example, in Germany, we see it on a federal level that they are actually using kind of like this reference to science to make a policy point and actively risking trust in science. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, very good point about the human values. I mean, we have analyzed this at the individual level. That, 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 I mean, so the actual challenge we've, we've had here is we've got so many results to show here. Um, so if you think about it, we've got sort of trust in science in general, we've got trust in climate change scientists, we've got trust in COVID scientists, and we've got this across six countries. So we had to, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a decision on my behalf to say, what are we going to present here at the moment? Um, now, when we do put them into individual level models, um, a lot of them come up significant, to be honest with you. The human values here are really quite significant. And then it's not always the universalism that, that, that's kicking in uh, or the achievement scale. There are other values at play here, depending on which country we run the models in. So the honest answer is here, A, we needed to actually sort of boil this down. B, we don't know how to interpret that at the moment. I mean, that's the honest answer. But what we did know when it comes to science communication um, that, that there is a separate field out there that has been looking at how do you best communicate to a public that has different value structures in it. So we just thought that at a country level that you need to be aware of the different sort of values in play there, that if you're going to try and get this message across, then you can't treat each country as if they're just the same country. You have to be aware of these background factors. Individual level, I can assure you, they are highly significant. Um, sometimes we don't know why that is at the moment. So we are really trying to figure that, that out. Um, sorry, what's your second point? I forgot. Okay. 
about kind of like this politicians actively risking uh, the loss of trust because they well, use this kind of like interview argument for a policy option. Yeah, so I mean, this goes back to a previous point. What would I advise politicians on this? What would I advise policymakers? I would advise them not to politicize science. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the short the short answer here. Um, and it would be great if we actually got into the stage when actually the scientific domain could act independently of politics here. I mean, I don't know how we make that happen, particularly in the UK. You can't stop politicians shooting their mouth off. You can't stop politicians using certain issues to maximise their vote share and so forth. Um, it would be great, though, if we establish a norm that this is a no-go area. Once something is established within the scientific community, there is a strong consensus on this, and it has the sort of you know, harmful effects that some of that climate change could have, that you just don't go there. You don't kick it around like it's a political football. So, I mean, that's the only, I mean, that's more of an appeal than, any, than anything else, but that's, that's all you can hope to happen, really. Thank you. We go online, and Lillian, please, it's your turn. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you again also for the very interesting presentation. I also have two questions, but I promise to make it short. The first question would be with this wealth of data and um, your very interesting survey instrument. How will this be available? Because I would be especially interested in how you uh, decided to differentiate between distrust, lack of trust and trust, because I, it seems you have measured this on a continuous scale. And there are also like these um, approaches to measure trust and distrust on different scales. And the second question after that would be, I have looked at your project homepage and there uh, one of the stated goals is to enhance trust. Um, but um, right now you have, or from what you have presented, you have only like um, investigated the correlates of trust. And I would be interested in whether you plan also to look at intervention and intervention efficacy, because uh, saying, oh, these are the correlates and then drawing policy implications from that, I find this always kind of hard to do. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, when it comes to the actual um, trust, um, distrust um, separation that we're trying to make here, um, what we need to do here is we need to rely on additional um, survey, survey items that we got. So it's really at that low end of the scale when you've got an absence of trust. And we really want to try and differentiate that from the, 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 the no trusters from the distrusters. The additional items that we got in here actually starts to ask about the character traits of certain scientists. So um, as well as the trust question, we've also got questions about the degree to which um, the motives of scientists and whether they're motivated for money, whether they're motivated by status and so forth. So the additional work that we're gonna do over the summer is we're gonna really try and focus on that end of the scale, the low end of the scale, and then we're gonna to start to bring in these additional measures that are related to the traits of scientists, the character traits of scientists, and whether the, when we can use those, that information from that variables to extend the scale even further backwards um, to really partition out these distrusters. Um, from those who just merely have an absence of trust. So that, that's the first thing I'd say on that. Um, on, the, on the second thing, I, I totally agree with you. Um, none of this in, a, in, a, in and of itself is sufficient to directly inform policy. Um, I mean, one of the things about the Prettier project is that there's actually um, lots of other projects going on about this, and there's a lot more experimental work that's going on. And uh, there's a talk this afternoon that's actually looking at, you know, sort of more interventions in terms of improving uh, the trustworthiness of um of uh, institutions as well so i totally agree with you this is this is merely sort of outlining the landscape here starting to think about the strengths and weaknesses of the data that we've got how we can actually improve that to actually as i say tease out uh you know more fine-grained concepts like distrust rather than the absence of trust um, but we make no claims here that we could directly inform policy and we rely on more of the experimental work yeah, for that. So, so if it, I will respond to that question in a minute, but could you also tell them where the results can be found? Oh, sorry. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I'm not actually sure. When's the data? Do you know about the data have been deposited? It's a good, once we have Armenia, yeah. Okay, yeah. So we actually still have another country in the field at the moment, um, which is Armenia. Um, so we'll be looking to get that data back um, end of summer. That might. Uh, hopefully soon. Hopefully the raw data. There are other tables. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I think it's the raw data that people can want access to here. So, yeah. Okay. So, so on the question of uh, building trust, that's the 
phase three of our project, which in fact starts today. And uh, there are going to be uh, citizen fora in five different countries uh, the, from the project, where we'll have qualitative assessment of people's thinking about uh, trust in science. For instance, this question of fatalism that might be creeping in or might be there, as Paul mentioned, will be something that we'll look into. And we are also working on building a uh, trustworthiness toolkit that's something that we hope would be a simple way of engaging with people uh, and helping them to decide who is trustworthy and who is not and on what grounds so that's the work of peritia for the next 11 months in fact and hopefully you'll have the results of that at that point as well so i think there was a question from the audience here i know uh if 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 no questions here, there's one person waiting very patiently online. Laura, it's your turn. And maybe you can introduce yourself more fully. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for the presentation. My name is Laura Smiley. I am from the European Commission, I'm heading up a multi-annual research program that's looking at the drivers of political decision-making and one of the co-authors of a recent report on values and identities. I was really interested in, in, in the way that you'd sort of taken the higher level Schwartz values. So looking um, at the sort of self-enhancement, which is opposite to universalism. But my question actually is more about what about the, the other two sort of higher end level uh, values being um, openness to change and conservatism, uh, if conservation. What happened there? How did how because there was just no reference to those whatsoever. And obviously when you're looking at polarization, et cetera, and various debates, often um, these are uh, very Im Im important considerations. So I'd love to hear a little bit more as to why they weren't included. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, well, to be honest with you, I mean, we did look at this um, at a country level uh, using all the different um, Schwartz's ones. So the, the short answer is, is that we, we found a lot of novel findings, actually, um, when we looked at these human values. And we were we did go into this expecting the universalism and the achievement ones to come up as the most significant ones. The openness to change one um we did hypothesize would have some level of relationship with but we we never thought it was going to be as strong as the universalism one i think the universal one is is, is certainly open yourself up to further inquiry it's other regarded uh, it talks about the environment um you know and obviously on the human uh, on the human value circle that you can see that achievement is sort of like the polar opposite of that so we we certainly expected the universalism one to work stronger than than the other ones um but to be honest with you the, we didn't present the um openness to change one simply because there, there was an old finding uh, however, that was at the country level. At the individual level, um, that does actually pop up as significant. Um, but again, we haven't really started to develop those individual level models more fully yet. Um, but those other values do come into play when we start to look at it at the individual level. But for some reason, they're just not translating um, in terms of the um, country level differences. And it was just universalism and achievement that did that. Um, but again, it's kind of watch this space because we are going to be running these individual level models and we're really going to try and better understand what it is about these values that's having this impact uh, on the outcomes that we've analyzed. And we really want to understand actually how these values work across different generations, actually, in particular, um, especially true for the UK. I mean, I suspect that actually one of the generational effects that's going on in the UK is to do with actually there are value differences across those generations there. Um, so one thing we'll be looking at is looking at building some interaction terms at the level of the individual here, looking at particularly how these values interact with um, age uh, and gender and, uh, and perhaps education too. So, um, but you're right, it is a bit of a miss. Thanks for spotted. And um, we will certainly be doing this with the individual of the data. Thank you very much. I think this is the right point to call this uh, public meeting to an end and thank Paul and uh, Finn for wonderful presentations and their patient responses to your many questions. I learned a lot as I hope you did as well. And as Paul said, watch this spot, much more coming out. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thanks for <laughs>